All right, so um, with that, thanks again, Arjun. And uh, with that, we'll actually be starting our first panel of the day. Um, so the topic here is really going to be UX onboarding. And we have Justin Moon from Biddle Bootcamp. We have Pierre Rochard, founder of Lightning Power Users, and Jack Mollers, uh, creator of Zap Wallet. And moderating the panel is going to be uh, Marcin Yamiak. Uh, he's a member of our own uh, MIT Bitcoin Club. And with that, I'd like to get this panel started off. Uh, uh, landing a node on the moon doesn't have to be rocket science. So let's hear it for our first panel. Hello. Hello. You guys can feel free to hold them if you want. You know, Thank you. Oh. All right. Hello. Uh, before we start, I think we should maybe get our panelists to introduce themselves. And I guess you can say how the topic uh, what the topic means to you. What are you working on in this space uh, relevant to this topic? So I'm Marcin. I'm a MIT student, so I'm not really working on this, but. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm Jack. I started Zap, and uh, I started it a year and a half ago. I think what I put on the website originally was making Bitcoin usable for everyone, which aligns pretty well with this topic. So working on Lightning and making sure people can use the actual asset. I'm Justin. I teach a class called Biddle Bootcamp. I started maybe four or five months ago, and uh, we got a couple people in the audience who are taking my class. And uh, it's about kind of uh, helping people who've uh, opted into the Bitcoin economy understand it more deeply and, and learn to uh, learn how it works and learn how to kind of work with uh, at, a, at a lower level, deepen your understanding, so you can kind of defend yourself a little better. Uh, Pierre Richard, uh, founder of Lightning Power Users. So uh, I built the Node Launcher, which is basically this desktop application that allows you to uh, connect your Bitcoin D with your LND and get on Lightning. And really, it was about scratching my own itch. Uh, so uh, it's just about making Lightning usable for myself. And then uh, there's uh, hundreds of people that jumped onto it and started using it as well. Um, so that's, that's become a, a full-time thing. Uh, and I also run uh, one of the largest uh, lightning nodes out there. Uh, so open up a channel to me and uh, let's let's send some stats around. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so I think one thing we can start with is the the serious thing about Bitcoin and lightning is that how much you think you need to know to actually start using Bitcoin. Uh, what, what do you think that line is? Where would you draw that line? Uh, I, so I think that you don't need to know anything. Uh, the, the only thing you really need to know is that this is highly experimental software and that you shouldn't put you know, your whole uh, life savings into it. Uh, but beyond that, really, you should just be like, all right, I'm going to throw away $20. In the worst case scenario, I'd lose $20 and my time. Uh, and then just run the software. Like, I, I, I don't think that you should spend too much time uh, trying to uh, know a baseline amount because you're going to learn that stuff as you go. Um, but I think that in terms of motivating yourself to, to learn, uh, there's just no better way than hands-on practical experience. Yeah, I think one of the best ways to learn about it is to actually use and interact with it. Uh, like I, I try to make my class sort of like a process of discovery, but you know you poke it and see what happens, and uh, I think that's largely the case. And there's it's you know adoption is kind of a spectrum. That's kind of going to be my main point, is that you know going from zero to twenty dollars, like Pierre is saying, you don't you know you don't need to know much, but you know as you advance further and further, you know b before you really uh, decide to store a lot of value in Bitcoin, you should you should learn more. Uh, both to see whether that's a good decision and whether and, and how to do it. Because there's a lot of ways you can shoot yourself in the foot with this because it's so experimental. Um, well, using Bitcoin is just buying it or participating in online discussion. There's this inaccurate notion that you have to be a genius to participate in some of this stuff. And it, it's really not true. Some of the most helpful people at Zap own Bitcoin and they try and download our stuff. And they're like, Jack, this is so confusing and it sucks. And, and there's a dialogue there that improves app and, and makes it what it is. Um, so using Bitcoin, it's a really broad definition, right? And it, it, it's not even a very helpful term, to be honest. Um, but to just get involved, I mean, the cost is nearly nothing, whatever a Satoshi costs, right? So there, there's, there's no barrier to entry, in my opinion. 
Okay, so I'll make the question a little bit harder. Uh, Jack, you're involved with getting like merchants involved, like for point of sale. So that's they gotta know more. They're putting in more than twenty dollars of Bitcoin. So, what minimum do you set for them to know before uh, you think they're set? Um, from my experience, the toughest thing for merchants is the volatility that they're exposed to, right? Um, so I think one of the problems that needs to be solved with Lightning in particular is the on-ramp and off-ramp between fiat and the actual asset. Um, so merchants actually, a lot of them prefer Bitcoin and Lightning as a payment rail. For example, the marijuana industry, um, my family is in the marijuana industry and our bank account gets shut down every single week. Um, and it's tough. Uh, so something like Lightning is very appealing. It's cheaper. Uh, but being able to get in and out, uh, so I, I th that's a problem that needs to be solved. It's obviously experimental. Um, don't store your company's worth on a Lightning node. Uh, but a lot of this, it, what's exciting is there's really authentic and organic demand for this type of payment rail. There are some serious in, uh, efficiencies, rather, um, to be gained from using this type of stuff. So that's exciting. People are experimenting. A lot of people in Colorado are spinning up uh, Zap point of sale stuff right now to sell a little bit of marijuana. And um, it's great. So I don't know if that totally answered your question, but that's my opinion on uh, merchants and lightning right now. Yeah, I think that's a, this is a good example where there, there are certain payments now that that won't get through if you try to use Stripe. Uh, like, like for my little class, I often have people try to sign up from like India or something. I've had a few, and the payments always, they never make it. Uh, they always get blocked either by the bank or by Stripe. And so these are customers that I would lose if I was on completely on the, the, the fiat system. And so I think one good way to use uh, Bitcoin is to supplement, just as a supplement for the, the transactions that won't be processed. Uh, if they have to go through the, the old payment rails. And that's a good way. It, it's just a small addition, but for stuff like this, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of payments that won't make it through. Yeah, I mean, so there's a thesis that I hold, which isn't like a genius insight, but uh, all activity on an asset is going to migrate towards the most efficient settlement, right? That's very clear and obvious. And if you look historically at previous assets, um, not ones that have layered protocols, but even like exchange linkage and traditional commodities, I mean, uh, Activity on an asset will migrate towards where it's most efficient and cheapest to settle. So when you look at it that way, what Lightning needs right now is it needs to be paired with a pool of liquidity underneath it um, so that the market can, can match on and off ramps between the asset and fiat. And when you do something like that, you can envision a user experience where I walk into a dispensary or a bar or whatever it is. I buy $100 worth of Bitcoin uh, in a Lightning wallet or on an exchange. I get it delivered to me instantly. I scan a QR code, and then that business can then turn it over and sell. 75 cents on the dollar or whatever they need and going in and out, all of a sudden the U UI doesn't even have to say that I'm using Bitcoin. I'm just using a much cheaper and efficient way of uh, settling and, and connecting peers and transferring value. Um, so that, I think, is the dream UX and I think it's much closer than we think. Uh, so, yeah. I think one, one other thing is that you need as a merchant, you well, if, if, if this sort of magic works where they don't even know it's Bitcoin, that's, that's even better, but a lot of times you need the customer to already own it, right? It's uh, that, that's sort of like the limiting factor, oftentimes. And so, I think how it works is like you know, if you're if you're selling clothes, it's going to be really hard for the average cost. Like, it's going to be hard to accept Bitcoin because like for a lot of your payments, because most people don't have it. But in like niche industries, it's a lot more reasonable to expect all the customers to onboard into Bitcoin. And you know, marijuana is probably one of them. Uh, uh, a lot of like Bitcoin services. Uh, like you know, if you're buying a hardware wallet, that that you know that whole industry can can live off you know largely off Bitcoin payments. So it's like it sort of like expands in concentric circles uh, of you know the markets that where, where you can make this assumption. Awesome. Uh, so I guess one other question I had is in this whole process, what do you think is going to be the biggest obstacle to getting people into Bitcoin right now, or getting uh, payment processors also involved? Uh, what was the last part of that? What is the biggest obstacle to get users or merchants involved? Um, in my opinion, it is mental, at least in uh, Western culture, uh, right? So when on-chain fees uh, could justify economic activity like online commerce, traditional commerce, brick and mortar, uh, there was not that activity on the blockchain. And this was what, 2013, 14, 15. Um, so that goes to show even when the technology is there to support and uh, 
economically it makes sense when fees were low enough that we weren't using Bitcoin in this way. So in my opinion, at least what I was just in China and it was a much different experience. Um, they're very familiar with QR codes, digital payments. Uh, but here I think that there's a serious mental barrier that needs to be broken down as far as people's relationship with Bitcoin and the asset itself. They aren't comfortable holding it. They don't look at it as very useful. They look at it as highly speculative. Um, and so things like uh, an ETF, more regulatory approval, not because I think we need them, but because the general retail investor and their confidence in the asset, like, hey, I'll take 10% of my uh, salary in Bitcoin because I know I'm going to gamble on Koala's chess game and I know that I'm going to go buy a joint and that that's okay and that it, uh, the market is more efficient, price discovery isn't so wackly insane, um, derivatives are better. And as this industry matures and our relationship with the asset matures, I think that that's uh, a way taller obstacle than the technology itself. The technology itself is moving at a grossly rapid rate, I think quicker than any other industry prior to this one. Um, so I think that it, it's mental more than anything. Uh, just change people don't really take well. So, yeah, I, I agree that it's mental. And like the, it, to me, the most important variable in that is just time. The longer Bitcoin is around, uh, the, the you know it, it coming out every ten minutes with a new block, and just working uh, reinforces. Uh, the like the the the, psycho the the psychological aspect of this thing is going to be around tomorrow. It's okay for me to hold it and use it today, uh, and that's just like the Lindy effect, basically. And we're ten years into it already. There's a lot of people that think that Bitcoin's going to be around for centuries, so uh, it, that's just going to spread. Yeah, I think uh, to, I agree. I think a lot of most people take it seriously, the, like the third time they hear it didn't die or something. You know, it's not the, uh, most people don't take it seriously the first time, nor should they, because there's so many things in the world to evaluate in your daily life. There's just not, you don't have the capacity. Yeah, and that's how advertising works as well, where you need to be exposed to an advertisement several times repeatedly before it's going to affect your purchasing decision. Uh, and so when people see Bitcoin on CNBC or whatever in the media because of some story about uh, whether it's you know a crime that happened with Bitcoin or the price going up or the price going down, uh, there's a certain percentage of the population that says, is that still around? That's still alive and kicking? Huh, I'm interested. I'm going to go dig into it. That was my experience. I think that's a lot of Bitcoiners' experience. Yeah, one, uh, oh, that was loud. Uh, so th this is the way I look at this question is like, I mean, part of it's like uh, may maybe Bitcoin's still a bad idea. We don't really know yet. But like, let's assume that Bitcoin works. And let's assume that someday it's the global money. Like in that case, uh, why did it take so long, right? Because it's already 10 years. It's probably going to be at least 20 or 30 years before we get there. Like, why did it take 30 years if, it's, if, if it was a good thing? And to me, and this is, this is why I work, do what I do, is I, I think it's largely education. People just didn't understand it. They didn't understand why it's valuable. They didn't understand how to use it. Uh, and so I think that's... Uh, I think we just need a lot more of that. I mean, with my little class, I was scratching my own itch. It was hard to understand at a deep level how the protocol worked. I was just like digging through GitHubs and stuff. It, it sucked. And so I know Pierre is starting to teach little workshops. I, th I just think we need like 100 times more of that. And we need it at every level, at a technical level and at a very superficial level, like uh, you know what Square did when they released Cash App. They had this like one, li one page little cartoon about what Bitcoin is. And I think that, I think that was phenomenal because they were very concise and playful with how they communicated it. So I think that's, I think education is the constraint. Yeah, on the topic of education, uh, I think one big problem in this space is people have a lot of misconceptions about what they need to like run a full node. Uh, what has your experience been with, with that and uh, teaching people how to get around those misconceptions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I think that there's a number of misconceptions. Uh, one is that uh, people get confused about the necessity of having some kind of specialized hardware. So they they come at it, and like, it's, it's not their fault. It, frankly, like Satoshi in the white paper, he says nodes and he's talking about like miners or vice versa. And so there's always been like this idea that uh, your, your node and mining are interrelated when today that's not the case at all. So like miners don't run nodes at all. They just use a mining pools node and uh, people who are running full nodes at home don't mine. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, just 
clearing the air around that is uh, kind of the first step. Uh, the, the, the second one is understanding what kind of hardware requirements are involved. So um, they, they think that, like it, it, that you need 250 gigabytes of, of disk space. So yes, you, you do if you want to be holding all the blocks on your hard drive. But you can set it to be pruning, and then you only need 10 gigabytes of disk space. So uh, there's like little education steps there where like with, with my node launcher, uh, it automatically turns on pruning if it detects that there's not enough hard drive space to be a full archival node. So there's little like UX tweaks we can do around that to, to make things easier. Um, and then the other challenge is, is the bandwidth. So uh, there's, um, there are people even in the US, who don't have the internet access necessary to do uh, initial block download. And uh, in my experience, like from what I've heard, that's about like 10% of the people uh, that communicate with me, that they, they have this issue. Uh, and from, from that point of view, like we need Neutrino. We needed it yesterday, but we'll probably get it at some point this year. Um, and. Uh, then the, the the last part of it is just understanding why. Like they don't. Uh, there's there's uh, <laughs> there needs to be more education about why a full node uh, should even be run on your laptop or your desktop uh, at all, and also how to actually use it. So with Node Launcher, it's very easy because you're just by default going to be using it because LND is going to be using your full node uh, to verify transactions that are coming in and out. So um, understanding that, OK, it doesn't matter if you spin up a full node and then don't use it. Like that's just. Uh, it, at the margin, it might help the network a little bit, but it's really not why one should be uh, spinning up a full node. You should be spinning up a full node because you want to use Bitcoin in a trustless manner, and also there are privacy advantages, et cetera. Um, last point I would make would be on the privacy side. Uh, we do need to be using Tor by default, uh, and that's something that I have on the roadmap for the node launcher, and I hope that it becomes more widespread uh, in the ecosystem. Awesome. Uh, Going along with the insights you've gained from people's misconceptions, is there uh, any other way that the misconceptions have guided your development? Like, is, is there things that users have pointed out to you that made you change what you're working on? Yeah, 100%. So um, one of the biggest things is like whenever I, I, I get a question from someone I, I, on Twitter or wherever it is, I answer their question, and then I go update my onboarding guide. I have like a Medium post that I, I direct people to uh, that has all this information in it that they can read through. And I try to make it so that uh, the layperson can read through it and understand what I'm trying to communicate. Uh, so if I fail, please uh, let me know, and I'll try to reword things. But um, it's definitely the case that I go back and update the, the onboarding guide, uh, and then I start thinking about, OK, are there features I could implement in the node launcher that would obviate this question, and then I don't have to uh, like help someone manually, because that just doesn't scale. So um, the, the development of the node launcher has been entirely like user driven, whether it's me as a user or other people that are communicating with me. So like one small example is I had a bunch of people say like, hey, in LND, how do I update my alias? And so like my instructions would be like, go into the lnd.conf configuration file, open that up, and then add alias equals blah, blah, blah. So one small fix is just, OK, I just added that to the node launcher. So now you just go in the GUI, and you can change your alias without having to go in the configuration file or have to know where the configuration file is. So there's like a bunch of like little tweaks like that where it is driven by what users want. So I didn't know that people wanted to modify their alias so much, but it's part of their identity and their node's identity. So um, yeah, it's, it's all about being user driven in, in my development process. Uh, Jack, do you have any insights on the same topic? Uh, I guess since you're lightning focused, are people asking you questions like, is lightning an altcoin? Uh, other misconceptions like that? Um, yeah, well, of course. I think one of the interesting characteristics of this industry is uh, there is no education center, right? So education is natural. You see these boom and bust cycles of people that have to learn for themselves and, and, and pay the cost. Uh, but as far as user feedback, I mean, any any good product builder, no one is really a creator. You're more of a crafter. You, you have to put things out there. And the users in the market are what tell you the truth. If you think otherwise, uh, you're going to fail. Um, so any good product is just a constant iteration. It's a constant 
and staying afloat and just not drowning. Um, and that's the true art of product is, is good listeners because um, the users are going to tell you exactly what they want if you can understand them. Um, so yeah, I, I think all, in particular with Zap, um, Zap is very little to do with me. Uh, I just have donated my time and energy to listening and trying to really understand uh, how people relate to this asset, how they envision using it, why they want to use it, and those type of things. And when you start to understand that, then uh, new features, new designs, color schemes, uh, t types of products, it becomes fairly trivial. I'm not brainstorming any of this stuff. It's just constant conversation with people. My, my experience here was like I, I plan to teach a class to like programmers, teach programmers about Bitcoin, and then, and then none of them signed up. And the market told me that, but the people that did sign up were all hodlers. And then I'll be like, Justin, you know, I'm, I learn fast, I can't code, and, uh, but you know, like where should I go? And so the, the kind of the, the market told me to, to focus on uh, the people who already see the value of Bitcoin and more teach them how to code, teach them how software works, rather than teach software people about how Bitcoin works because they don't care. What I've loved about Justin's Biddle Bootcamp is that uh, he'll have students then go on to my Node Launcher code repository and contribute code there. So that's been really nice to see uh, because it is written in Python, so it's very accessible to new developers. And my own background is not software development. I, I got a master's in accounting and kind of self-taught myself uh, uh, Python. So uh, if you are not a developer but you want to learn, go to Justin. Uh, and then come work on the node launcher with me. I think that no one here's background was in software development originally, which is an interesting fact. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was uh, like a, it's it's way more accessible than you you think, and you don't have to be like a, become a pro. Uh, like so, this last weekend I was in Chicago and I did a little hack day with a guy like the one of the lead developers of BTC Pay Server, which is like the 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 probably the, one of the coolest apps in Bitcoin. It, it helps you run an, uh, your own node and accept payments without relying on a third party. Uh, and they have a really nice, it's like BitPay, but it's uh, self-hosted. And it's amazing. And so we did a little uh, hack day, and we had like four people show up. Three of them had never made an open source contribution before, and by the end of the day, everyone had. And so they, they were all like, I want to do more of this stuff and just you know, to give people a little taste of what it's like. Because even in academic settings, you don't really, uh, you know, you go through a book, you don't actually build something. And it's really intoxicating to go on GitHub, download code, see an issue, fix it, get it up there, and have it deployed by the end of the day. Uh, it's, it's, it's intoxicating. You, you, can't, you can't stop once you get a taste of it. It's also nice to just have like teamwork because yeah. I, I, my background, like I've always been kind of individualistic, an individual contributor, uh, but having a, a team is just a huge force multiplier and everyone's on the same mission. Everyone's excited about Bitcoin and Lightning. So uh, it's, it's been tremendous to see the uh, open source energy. And it's uh, the teamwork that you get in an open source environment is, is much different than you'd find in a workplace or a school where people are, you know, they're sort of like assigned to you. You know, like the few people that end up seriously contributing to Z to Zap, for example, or Node Launcher, they're like, they they elect in. They're one of like the ten people in the world who chooses to do it, and they all have these interesting, diverse backgrounds, and they have an incredible motivation, and and they're uh, that that quality of teamwork and uh, camaraderie is is a lot of is, is a lot of fun, and it's different than I had experienced before. Awesome. Um, on that note, I guess we can talk a little bit about onboarding uh, users or developers. What do you think it will take to get more developers into like the Lightning development community? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think that, um, well, it, w w as we were saying, uh, there's uh, one of the misconceptions here is that you have to be uh, like highly mathematical, quantitative mind in order to be, you have to be like a computer scientist to uh, do development work, which is just not the case. Like uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is, um, is is not quantitative. It's not mathematical. It's almost. It's more literary. It's compositional. It's it's. It's like writing. Tight. They yeah. say writing code. If you, if you can write well, if you can, uh, you know, make an essay, you'll probably be able to make a computer program. Yeah. I I think though. Uh, to Pierre's point earlier about Bitcoin just surviving and being around and being entrenched more in people's brain, uh, Zap contributors, I think Zap now has surpassed 45 contributors, which is phenomenal, uh, and. 
these contributors contributing to Zap, you're competing with their time, uh, right? Like, they could be doing many things, spending time with family, watching TV. Um, so the longer that this stuff is around and proving to be beneficial to the world, um, it it is highly competitive with other things they can be occupying their time with. So I think there is this network effect similar to Bitcoin where the longer these things are around and they realize they could gamble on chess, they can do certain things that uh, everyone around the world's passing a invisible torch, um, that there is, it's gaining uh, more power in, in competition with folks time. Um, and gradually you'll just see these numbers grow and grow and grow. So um, in my opinion, time is the most beneficiary aspect of, of all of this. Yeah, so one of the really tough things here, this is like the big learning I've had the last few months, is that uh, if you try to get somebody involved in Bitcoin development for the same reasons they, they do most career, make most career decisions, which is like an economic incentive, as soon as they get the skills to contribute to Bitcoin, they will go and work on shitcoin scams every single time because you make so much more money, like five times, ten times more money. Uh, and so by definition, everyone who is working on Bitcoin is underemployed in an economic sense. And so this is why I focus on helping hodlers get skills because these are people who probably, they're in the minority who won't make this decision and who will stick around and work on Bitcoin maybe because they have a different incentive because they have already opted into this economy. Uh, they're storing their wealth here. Uh, they, they actually really need to learn to protect themselves because like there's a lot, you know, you don't, uh, you don't like, outsource your self-defense as much in, in, in Bitcoin like you do just trusting a bank that they're not going to let someone log in and transfer your money. You have to, you have to take care of this yourself. So I, I think the incentives for that class are better than for you know, a, a top flight hacker who uh, will immediately go do an ICO or something. Awesome. So we have a couple of minutes left. Why don't we take a few audience questions before we end? Uh, if you have a question, come down. Or here you go, this one over there. Voila. Use the microphone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted you mentioned at one point um, uh, downloading the initial blockchain was a barrier to adoption. Are you aware of there being any standard containerizing format that somebody could put it on a hard drive or BitTorrent or something like that? Yeah, so uh, you can you can kind of think about initial block download as a form of BitTorrent where you because you do connect to like eight peers and then you're downloading blocks from them. So it's very similar to to BitTorrent. Uh, the the issue really is that uh, their their internet connection is is slow or their ISP has a data cap where they can't download more than X number of gigabytes per per month, um, and so that's that's a showstopper for them. Now I would emphasize that that. It's just a very small percentage of people. And I know that there's like a lot of politics into this because of the, the block size limit and all that. But the reality today is that um, it's not an issue for uh, many people that I, I talk with. Now, maybe there's a selection bias there. Um, the bigger issue just seems to be the why question of why run a node, uh, and then the uncertainty of what does it entail? Like, it's just they got to uh, jump o over the chasm and just do it. The reality of like being decentralized or self-hosting, like th those things mean nothing. Like there's a, there's a user that is looking to accomplish a thing, and things like decentralization, it's a sliding scale, and you choose your wins and your losses. So there are people that are fine being a light client, fine hosting with Coinbase, uh, and I mean, if you want to be your own bank. Sorry, it takes you eight hours to verify. Like, our bad. Like, so I wouldn't say anything is necessarily a barrier to adoption per se. I think that that is uh, largely a social attack, in my opinion, to think that uh, a lot of this stuff, like uh, block size limit, um, initial block download, uh, bandwidth requirements, are going to prohibit Bitcoin from being successful. I think that that's a little bit insane. But there, there, are, uh, there are like uh, commercial providers like Casa who ship a node that's mm -hmm. pre-synced to a certain block. And so it's a little more convenient, but then you trust them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, and for, for the node launcher, like the UX roadmap is that uh, once Neutrino is on mainnet, when you open up the node launcher, it's going to use Neutrino and sync Bitcoin in the background. So you can be transacting on Lightning very quickly, uh, and then you'll get rolled on to having your full node and being decentralized. And the user just won't even know about it. Uh, and it, it'll all be done in the background for them. And the, there will be you know, thousands of people that don't know that they're running a full node. They just think that they're just using Lightning. Next question over there. Hi. 
Um, sorry, this isn't a serious question, but <laughs> in a game of lightning chess between you three, which one would win? <laughs> I, I don't know the rules of chess, so. Okay. <laughs> I think even you beat me, so I think he's going to crush me. <laughs> I'd like to see that. Thanks very much for the panel. I think we have time for one more. Shanak over there, right next to you. Or, oh, yeah. So if there's a lot of potential upside left for Bitcoin, especially in the price, why would people be incentivized to spend it today when it's down, you know, 85%? Why would they want to even utilize the Lightning Network? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, the, but the, 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 the serious answer is that uh, there's, there's different demographics of, of people. So um, there are people who uh, just want to experiment because in, in their minds, uh, Lightning increases the value of Bitcoin. So like, I think that's a little misguided, but they, they do think that if Lightning is successful, then it's going to turn this bear market around and, and they're going to become rich. Um, others, like, they don't think that Lightning is, is going to uh, you know, change the price dynamic, but they do know that in the future, in 10, 20 years, they do want to be able to use Bitcoin as you know, walking around money and to be able to spend it in a consumer context. And so to them, it just makes sense to like experiment today to make sure that that's in place in 10 or 20 years. Um, others bought Bitcoin when it was at 10 cents. And now they are looking to spend their Bitcoin. And so it just makes sense for them to try to find the best UX for doing that. Uh, I think, though, also, the first use case for Lightning is going to be making markets much more efficient than it is for like the retail investor to be pushed to buy a hot dog with Bitcoin as opposed to their fiat. Um, so going back to the use case of I walk into a, a bar or dispensary or whatever it is, uh, and I'm looking to transact, and I buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on the spot, it gets delivered to me in a channel instantly, and I'm there to spend. It's the equivalent of, of the dollars that were in my Chase bank account, right? The friction there, and now what's actually happening abstractly is you're taking the settlement of a bare instrument um, and you're increasing the velocity of the asset into a market that is extremely, extremely important. Um, price discovery, market efficiency, um, efficiency of OTC deaths and liquidity providers, the deep pools of liquidity crossing its spot, that, that is immense, immense value. And then from there, as the asset and industry matures, then maybe one day we can see some normal economic activity uh, as price volatility goes down and speculation seems to be lesser uh, of a use case. Um, but improving market efficiency, I mean, the fact that if I want to execute any type of on-ramp, off-ramp transaction in Bitcoin, settlement of the asset could take me days between a block six confirmations and going through custodians where with Lightning it is less than a second. Uh, you'll see that, and that's not necessarily spending it, but that is some serious value to improving an asset class. Great. Um, so with that, I, I think let's give a really big hand to our panelists.